Um, I um, have always loved nature. I have three brothers, and my dad happened to call me Nature Boy. And my other brothers love nature, but I'm the one who looked at the butterflies in the garden and you know, all that stuff as a kid. And um, I've done a lot of cross-country traveling since the mid-'90s. I could almost be, a, if I wanted, be a tour guide to national parks. And, and, and whenever I, please turn that on for now, oh, sir. Could you? Okay. Just, Just I can't see it. <laughs> I always, I always photographed anything that moved. I just love taking pictures of, of scenery and wildlife. And um, one year I got some literature from the Seminole Audubon about a four session course uh, designed to teach you how to identify birds. Up until that point, even though I'd been a member of West Felicia Audubon, when I heard about birding field trips and um, bird counts and all, I said to myself, that sounds great, but all day long, so I never got involved. Now I'm the guy who's leading them after taking that identification course. <laughs> so I'd like to start by talking briefly about binoculars and cameras. You have to be able to see the birds and, hope, and, and from my point of view, be nice to identify them. Okay. Many people, including me, did not know that when you have a normal set of binoculars, not only is there a dial to focus, that one of the eyepieces has its own dial. And you may, if you don't know this, you'll probably forget it, but you can ask Google and get little videos on how to do this. If you take your binoculars and the, the, the side with the dial, you cover it up. And so when you use the regular focus dial, you're, you're in this case, your left eye, it's in focus for your left eye. And then you, with the closing the left side, if you turn the dial for your right eye, it's now in focus for your right eye, so you've personalized your binoculars. Now, if you don't do this at all and just do normal focusing, you still see things pretty good. But literally, you're creating, your binoculars are focused for your eyes. And then after that, you just need the normal focus dial. Okay, having said that, cameras. I love taking pictures, but from the point of view of, other than just taking a nice picture of a pretty bird or something, the point of view of learning to identify birds, well, instead of you looking with your binoculars and taking notes, you know, the bird size and this and that, and then going to look through an identification book or something, a field guide, if you take a photograph of the bird, you just, it's a lot easier to figure out what you've got. This is a picture of the street I live on. My house is here. I'm on a corner property, then this, go down the street. Now, I can't prove it to you, but I, there is a bird on this top wire here. You cannot see it. This, is a, this particular camera is called a point and shoot. Just like your cell phone's a point and shoot, you don't have lenses to change. However, the style and all the manufacturers make it, this happens to be a, a Canon, it could be a Nikon or anything else. And this particular one has got a 65 times optical zoom. Okay? These humongous camera lenses you see, like news reporters and all, those are 600 or 800 millimeters. This is 1,365 1, millimeter equivalent, it's called. Now, it may not ultimately take the same quality as those cameras, and, but you're not getting your picture in Life magazine. <laughs> but let me show you what happens. So when you get my little okay. button. Sure. Here, you want to do this? It, oh, thank you. When I zoom out 65 times, there's a bird up there. And, in any digital camera you have nowadays, you can enlarge the picture, crop it is called. And when you crop this, it fills. So on your camera, you can see the whole bird that you couldn't, almost couldn't see just with your naked eye at a distance. And that happens to be our northern mockingbird, okay? And by the way, during this presentation, 
if anybody has a question or even wants to share something, you know, just say, hey, Eli, you know, stop me. And if I get fumbled about it, where I was doing, don't worry. Let's, let's, we'll interact and, you know, many, m many times when someone has a thing to share, it's, it's of interest to everybody. So just simply, we have, start with, we have two, well, we have many classifications, but there's two particular classifications, our resident birds that are here all year round and migrants, most of which come here in the winter. Snowbirds, you heard the term. <laughs> this is a Carolina chickadee. We, this, this bird is in our neighborhood and backyard all the time, whether we notice it or not. And there are several kinds of chickadees across the U.S. This is, a, this is the one we happen to have in our backyards. Anybody here from up north? Yeah. Used to li anybody lived up north? New York, New Jersey, Maryland. The one up north looks pretty close to this. It's called a black cap chickadee. Yep, yep, there we go. And by the way, the, the possibility of having a, another species of chickadee in your ba backyard is extremely rare. So if you see one, presume it's this guy. <laughs> Our northern, mo uh, northern, northern cardinal, male and female. I'm with a rotary club. And we have exchange students, high school exchange students, from time to time. And one year we had a boy from Europe. He was from Belgium or the Netherlands. I forgot for the moment which one. But I took him on a drive from Deltona to Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and back. And we, we took the route going on Route 46. So we were out in all kinds of good birding areas. We had 70 bird species we saw that day. And I asked them on the way home, which was his favorite? The male cardinal was this, and we saw roseate spoonbills and stuff, you know, that blow your mind, but in Europe they don't have such a bird, and it was a big deal when he saw it. This is the slide having to do with, but there's so many of those guys, I don't know how, which one's which. <laughs> as far as the birds that we call egret, with one exception, this is it. The great egret, the snowy egret, and the cattle egret. And the cattle egrets from Africa, 40, 50, 60 years ago, we didn't even have that in the US. So is that so difficult, guys? <laughs> and the snowy has yellow feet. Yes, the snowy egret, if you look at, well, toes, feet or toes, whatever you want to call them, but yellow feet, it's got the nickname, the bird with the golden slippers. <laughs> um, and one of the cool things to me, each one has the cool things, but the great egret, he, eats not just little fish, he will eat grasshoppers and other things. And I, the closest lake body of water to my house is a half a mile away, but I have these guys in my neighborhood once in a while looking for little lizards and things. Yeah. Yeah, they do. This is the other white egret. The reddish egret every so often has an offspring. It's not an albino, but it just simply comes out with pure white feathers. And you'll only see these guys in shallow salt waters around Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. So you're not going to run into one of these in your backyard. <laughs> so once again, you know, there's only really three white egrets you know, that you'll see. And by the way, these guys fish by walking in shallow water with their wings up. And they're literally herding little minnows and all. And then when there's enough of them like packed in, then they start plunging like this. But they, 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 they joke, it's joked about they look like somebody who's drunk <laughs> when they're walking along. The brown thrasher. Everybody here presumably has heard mockingbirds up on a perch singing a repertoire of every, all these different songs and calls. The brown thrasher does that as well. And even though it's nice to see the bird you're hearing, if you happen to hear what sounds like a mockingbird, but each call is done a single time, it's the brown thrasher. And it actually is a pretty more melodious call, but either way, there is a second bird in your neighborhood that does that type of. in numbers because we used to have lots, and I don't think I've seen one. I'm sorry, say that again. Have they diminished, they diminished in numbers? numbers? The, brown, the brown thrashers? Um, 
let's put it this way. I don't know the diminished or not, but sometimes a family might move or die out. Because most birds, when they're not migrating, the ones that migrate, most birds are, have a particular neighborhood they're in. The cardinal you see in your backyard one day is probably a month later the same one you see then too. You know, just, like, just, just like, even though mice don't have wings, just like mice, you know, mice in your, in your backyard, if you, had, if you saw a mouse, wouldn't, be, wouldn't have been a mile away, you know, a month ago. You know, they, they have their own little neighborhoods. What's the difference between those two? Oh. The thrashers. Uh, um, they're both, well, first of all, you, you can't tell which is a male or female in any way that I know. Okay. And these are just two different pictures I happen to take at different times. But they sing like the mockingbirds? Yes, yes, yes. And I was explaining that if each, each call that they do, they only do it once, so you're hearing only once, then it's the brown thrasher. The mockingbird does the three or four times each call, then three or four times. Okay. So if you hear something like that and you don't see the bird, you can still tell, if you remember that, who's doing it. <laughs> tufted titmouse. Raise your hand if you've ever seen a tufted titmouse. Most, ha most hands went up. Yeah. This is, this is one of the most important birds to a birder. A birder is a person who actively goes out to seek birds versus a bird watcher who enjoys watching a bird when they happen to, happen to see one. <laughs> this bird, when it's out foraging in the, tree, in the tree branches and all looking for little insects, grubs, worms, you know, whatever's up there, other birds, other small birds, warblers in particular, woodpeckers even, will kind of like be, in, be around the, the titmouse as it's moving through the trees. And it, it forms what I call a loosely formed foraging flock. And if you have a recording of the titmouse, you know, the tufted titmouse playing some of its calls, the titmouse will come over to where the sound is coming from, and the other birds hang around. So if you hear one titmouse play the call, you may see five, six, seven, eight, or more other species, warblers, you know, other birds. It's, it's, it's really cool. <laughs> and it, it works. <laughs> and once in a while, if you were just simply to go out in your backyard or you're walking in a wooded area, you play the titmouse call, you can actually have wherever they are, all of a sudden in a few minutes show up right around you. <laughs> The boat tail grackle, male and female. Um, my favorite nickname or whatever for this is the Walmart parking lot bird. <laughs> and and now, now it's the, over, if you're over in Daytona Beach, it's the Bucky's parking lot bird. It plays a <laughs> mob scene with them. And the blue gray gnat catcher, they're here, I've heard two different takes on this. I, one is that they're, they migrate, and yet other times I've seen them, you know, in, in the winter once in a while too, but this is, this is one bird that almost nobody notices because they're up in the tree branches and they don't make any noise a lot. They make little teeny sounds. Are they really little? Are they like, I, aren't they awfully small? That's yes. Pretty small. I think they're... But, but when you're out looking, this is one of our local birds. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to see. Yeah. That's why we have binoculars. <laughs> <laughs> the American robin. Uh, my wife asked me the other day where the heck the robins were. Well, I happen to have been in a town called Congers, New York. It's in Rockland County, just north of New York City, uh, three weeks ago, and there were robins there. So I said, I guess they haven't, I mean, there's have to be some around, but. I guess they just haven't all come down here yet. <laughs> I have bunches of them in my yard now. Yeah, anyway. I'm glad you said that. I live in a part of Deltona that a few blocks from me is a large open tract of land. It has something on it now, but it, for years, the bulk of it has still been open, multiple acres. And a friend of mine who lives on the other side, this is some time back, but he said, you know, I haven't seen a single robin. And I said to him, 
we have so many friggin' robins in our neighborhood in the morning, I can't hear the other birds calling. <laughs> Just, you know, four, blo three, four so blocks have away. Too. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, the one on the right, and I saw that, it's, um, you know, once again, it, it's a full adult, but it came out a different coloring. Yeah. Uh, and very different. in the lower left, you got a mom with the two chicks there. The chicks have speckles. <laughs> the eastern meadowlark, as more and more meadows and pastures and things are turning into subdivisions, <laughs> um, we still have habitats for these birds. And le relative to Deltona, if you're over by the Lake Jessup area, or the Lake Monroe Conservation Area off of 415, those that I call the floodplain cow pastures, loaded with these birds. So they're still around. And one of the, other than they're very pretty, they have a very beautiful call. It's one of the prettiest calls of any bird. The red-winged blackbird, male and female. In the upper right, a juvenile male. It doesn't have the, the, the full rich colors on it yet. But the female, if, it, if, you, if you've never noticed, basically looks like a large sparrow. <laughs> it does. And, and when, I, when, I, when I, for myself, I happened to notice one day that the males, which in most cases, the males do most of the singing and talking when it comes to the bird world, mm -hmm. the male red-winged blackbird, literally, as it's, as it's just starting its call, it's, it's, it basically is kind of puffed up. <laughs> and so I started looking to notice that, to take pictures of it, and it worked out fine. And by the way, red-winged blackbirds, if you, if, you, if you may not know this, but when you're driving, and I do a lot of cross-country travels in, this, in the uh, summertime, except for the actual desert areas in the top of the mountain there, they're everywhere out on the Great Plains. You, you know, cornfield after cornfield after wheat field. <laughs> they, they're Full of red -winged hugely distributed in the U.S. The eastern towhee, uh, that bird is typically in the same neighborhood as the scrub jays. <laughs> if you're here walking around Lyonia Preserve and you hear something that just sounds just like a single whistle like a person might do, you're hearing an eastern towhee. And picture male and female. How big are they? I'm sorry? How big? Not that big. Yep. Cedar wax wings. I was in the park, I was at the DeBerry Library one day, this is you know, 8, 10, 11 years ago. And they have a few of these little holly trees planted in the parking lot. And I walked out to my car, and all of a sudden, just about 10 feet from me, the swarm of these birds came down from a big pine tree and started devouring the berries on the holly tree. <laughs> and I happened to like loquats, and a neighbor of mine has a loquat tree. And when I had my house built in 04, I took some of the seeds you know, from the loquats on this tree and planted them. I've got now several loquat trees, and every spring, um, like April-ish time, uh, four, 30 or 40 of these uh, cedar wax wings will come into my yard, and they work their way down the tree line, and in about a month, they finally white, eat, eat all the fruit. And this, is, this is fun for me to see, but for the birds, because they're going to be migrating back north again, you know, it gives them their, their bulking up for their energy, I guess. But, I get to enjoy these they're birds in my in yard. Flocks. Yeah, they're always in flocks. Say, it seems like it. Uh, as a young, as a kid, I heard it. You know, I I grew up thinking from the media as it is that birds flock. You know, that lots of birds flock and fly in large groups. Well, here in Florida, I mean, there's ibis, um, fish, crows. There's a few birds that do fly in large groups, but most of them don't. This is one of the exceptions. You see a group of, let's say, 15, 20, or 30, they look like very modest-sized birds in this loose group going like this. It's cedar waxwings. They're, and they're our winter visitors, so you see it in the summer, there's somebody else. <laughs> the first I ever saw 
about 50 of them landed in a maple tree right outside my bedroom window and stayed there long enough for us to find the bird book and look them up. Very good. <laughs> so here's the deal. It's kind of like so simple, but let me say it. Wherever a particular bird species happens to nest and breed a nest, that's usually in the summer, spring, springtime, okay? And migrant birds spend the winter, fall and winter time in somewhere else, in Florida, okay? But while they're here, they're not tending the babies or they're not, you know, nesting. So many of these birds get together in large groups. That's why in Deltona in particular, you'll see all these fish crows around. I had, one time I was at Lake Jessup Conservation Area, actually the first time I was ever there. And it was, happened to have been this time of the year. And there were some cows out on the pasture. We were out, you know, out in the floodplain area. And all of a sudden, hundreds of crows just rose up from the grass around where the cows were. And I have videos of this to prove it, even though it's not here. And like, it must have been 800 or 1,000 of them in the air in a big area. And they were all moving like in a slow cyclone around. And, and a few days later, my wife went back there again. Not only was that group there, but I saw two more. I was probably looking at 4,000 fish crows you know, somehow or another out there. And I just want to share, it's like, just, that was part of my learning about that. I just never experienced it. But we're on, like the, I believe, the flight path between Lake Jessup, where they spend the night, and where they eat out, you know, out and around in, in their larger area. The gray catbird. Raise your hand if you've ever seen or heard a gray catbird. I was, I was on a street, Antoinette Street in Deltona one day when I was just starting my birding learning and all, and I heard a gray catbird. And I walked across the street and down a, block, a, a property or two where there was a vacant lot with trees on it. A cat walked out. <laughs> and I, I thought I had a gray catbird. I was at a camp, a campground a few states from here. I don't remember where it was at the moment, but there was a gray catbird up in a tree doing what the mockingbird and the, the other one I mentioned, in the brown thrasher, it was singing a repertoire. I've, and I've only heard it one time like that, but apparently gray catbirds do that too. These are winter visitors. Yeah. These are winter visitors. Is there one that's similar to that? Because we have birds like that that we see all the time. The, uh, there's no other bird that I can think of that's a normal bird for us around here that's, yeah. Except a mockingbird. Mockingbird's probably the closest like looking. That. Well, uh, but. She's got her, this young lady has her head up. Oh, who, who, oh, yes? What kind of sound do they make? This bird? Yeah. I can't copy it exactly, but they sound like a cat in the alley. That's where the name. Now, over here, the vent area, as it's called, the poopy place, <laughs> it's got a burgundy red color. And if you happen to notice that, which if you're using binoculars or your zoom camera, like I'm showing you, then you'll see that. So the, and it also has a black cap on its head. Okay, it's gray with the black cap in the red vent area. I have a sound. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey. It's pretty close. Okay. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Eastern bluebird, male and female. We have a fair amount of eastern bluebirds in our community. When I was with my friend, my wife and some friends on Lake Gleason uh, this past Sunday, we, there were two different locations going around it. We saw half a dozen Eastern Bluebirds. Mm -hmm. And one time I was on Fowler Drive or whatever it's called, off of Coverleaf and Deltona Boulevard. Yeah. 
And up in the power lines, this was like just at dusk, there was at least 12 or 13 of the guys. Wow. We have at it's least in, you know, one part of town. We have, we have eastern bluebirds. And those are migrants? Nope, these are residential. Cool. Yeah. This is the male. Um, this would be another male. And this is a juvenile. It's not a great picture, but it's the best I had. It's got little speckles in front. Tree and barn swallows. This is our summer and winter. In the summer, the barn swallows are what you see in here. And more likely than not, since they're nesting, you need to be somewhere near bridges and water and all, because they build their nests under overhangs. And under bridges or, or large culvert pipes, they'll have their nests in there. And, and, and in the winter, the, from up north, we have coming down here then the tree swallow. One, one of the simplest part, thing about these two birds to identify, and one is the barn swallow is very colorful. And the tree swallow has got this beautiful bluish blue, and actually some green in there, even though it doesn't show it. But from, a, from just under its beak, all the way down its entire underparts, as it's called, pure white. And no other swallow is pure white completely. So each one is very easy to identify. One you know one, the other one, because we have a few other swallows around, but they're very uncommon. So, th so these are the ones you mostly see in our neighborhood. Do they, do they stay in flocks too? Or do they go well, individual? Well, the tree swallow who's here in the winter, they breed up north. So down here, they're not breeding or nesting. So they, they're in very large flocks. Large you can, up at Lake Woodruff, friends of mine have seen a thousand or more up in the air at once. Oh, yeah. And this is why we're here, because of the scrub jays. <laughs> if you visit Lyonia Preserve periodically or often enough, you're all but guaranteed at some point you'll have a bird on your head or your shoulder or your finger. My story is this. When this facility first opened, the grounds, because uh, I heard that about these scrub jays. That, I was not a birder at the time, but I heard about these scrub jays, and they were supposed to be friendly birds. Uh -huh. And so I'm, my wife and I are walking on one of the, the trails out here, and she's a little bit ahead of me. I can't quite see her. And, I, and as I'm walking along, at just about this height on a little bush right next to me, like 10 feet from me, there's a scrub jay. And this business about how friendly they are. So I slowly was walking over with my finger, like maybe it'll perch on my finger. Well, as I got very close, he started to lean forward. Then I said, ooh, I don't want it to peck my finger. So I started walking on my second step. He was on my head or my shoulder. <laughs> the very first time I ever came here. <laughs> nice story. Of course, that one I couldn't do anything about because you, it's hard to take a picture, whatever. You can't take <laughs> but, a but, but, have, but being here with other folks on the field trips and all, there's been plenty of take, taking each other's pictures with the birds on you. Blue jay. Um, this, is a, this is a bird that, for somebody who's not familiar with American birds, would think this is, my god, what a colorful, what a wild bird that is. For us, of course, it's like, eh, it's another blue jay out there <laughs> eating the seeds for the smaller birds. <laughs> Just, we treat them almost like a squirrel sometimes. <laughs> they are aggressive. They're loud, they like too. That. They're quite loud. My grandmother, and this was in um, just outside of West Hartford, Connecticut. I'm from Connecticut originally. She picked up a baby blue jay in their yard, and the mom came down, and she had a little bloody spot on her head from the mom coming to protect the baby. Aww. So I, as a young person, I, I, I knew about that. <laughs> They're the first ones to warn everybody in the neighborhood if there's a predator. You'll hear them, yeah. you know, if there's a cat or something, yeah, and they cats. warn all the other birds that there's something. Well, the ones in my neighborhood are so noisy sometimes, I, I'm not sure what they're, yeah. but I, yes, <laughs> that could be the case. <laughs> uh, raise your hand if you're familiar with the loggerhead shrike. 
This is a bird that typically when you see them, they're up on a power line, because that's well, obviously it's most visible to see any bird is on a power line. And at first glance, you, to me, they almost look like a mockingbird, the general, the general overall shape and the tail length. But, when, but then you realize it is not a northern mockingbird. And this is a resident bird. These are with us all year round. This bird has an interesting habit. It'll catch a grasshopper and impale it on barbed wire or a thorn and come back at a later time to eat it. I've heard uh, stories about why that time is. One is that the grasshoppers may have some type of a toxic gland in them or something, and it, it dissipates with time. or or are they just simply storing up food, you know? And, there's, and one day on a cross state, just Sunday drive, my wife and I, I happened to notice two shrikes up on a power line by a utility pole. And there was a, a chain link fence with the barbed wire on top. And I got out to take a picture, and then I realized there's a grasshopper on that barbed wire. <laughs> so yeah. And they're overlapping. Beaks are a way to identify them, too. Yes. A fellow named David Hartgrove, he's with Halifax River, Daytona Beach Audubon, and he shared with me how he got involved with birds and birding. He was a, a, a power line worker down in South Florida, and he and another fellow were in one of their trucks just having their lunch, and the other fellow pointed some bird activity to them. David was watching a loggerhead shrike, which is about that big, eating its meal. It was tearing apart a sparrow. Oh, and David saw that, and that got him interested to start learning more about birds. And plus, this is a beautiful bird, you know. It's just, it how, do, how are you going to beat that mask? <laughs> Great crested flycatcher. The upper left is in my, was in my backyard. It looked like the bird was just smiling at me while I was singing. This is a summer visitor, and they do nest in Florida. Uh, this picture at the lower right, uh, oops, sorry, sorry, hey, wrong button. There's a pipe going into the concrete wall here, and there's a little opening. This um, great crested flycatcher, this is up in um, Lake Helen. I happened to be driving down the street and noticed this. Um, they, they nest in cavities, or they, if you have a, a bird nesting box in your yard, you know, or a tree, tree with a hole in it, almost like a woodpecker, but woodpeckers usually don't go in concrete block cavities, but this one is nesting in there. Just a beautiful bird. And this type of bird, this, this grouping of flycatchers, there's four or five, maybe six of them, different sets of species around the U.S., but this is, this is our regular summer visitor. And if you do hear the call of it, it, it in some ways sounds like a modified red-winged blackbird, not red-winged blackbird, red-bellied woodpecker call. But either way, it's, it's a very distinctive call. And when, once, you, once you're familiar with it in the summertime, you hear it regularly in Deltona. Eastern Phoebe is our other very local flycatcher. This is a winter visitor. With the summer visitor we just showed, this is the winter visitor. And it's called the Phoebe because it says, Phoebe, Phoebe. You know, it named itself. <laughs> and in this type of flycatcher, there's, there's um, at least one or two more out west that are similar. There's a, uh, the black Phoebe and there are a couple others, but look very similar, but different colorations. Baltimore Oriole, male and female. The nest on the upper left is an oriole nest. I don't know that it was Baltimore or a different oriole, but that or, almost all the oriole nests are all of them are just like a hanging sack here. That's how they build their nests. Baltimore orioles are, none of the orioles are common in Florida, but in the wintertime, we do have, a, we do have between the Baltimore and the orchard oriole, they are around the state, so you, do, you will see them from time to time. Uh, at Lake 
Apopka Wildlife Drive along the lake itself near the pump house, if anybody's familiar with that as I'm saying it, there, there have been in, in many years orchard orioles uh, habitating that area. And that's the orchard orioles, male and female. It's a, even a much darker, richer color than the Baltimore, which is considered a beautiful bird as well. House finch, and I believe house finch is actually what they call an exotic. It's originally from Europe, I believe. And um, I've always, you know, the, the male with the, dark, the red color, and then I found out over at Tom Rennick Park in Ormond-by-the-Sea, there are house finches that have almost an orangey uh, coloration. And when I looked it up in my Sibley book, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the majority, but it's, it's, it's a regular that you find them with the orange color. Eli, yes. can you talk about their beaks and how if you look at a beak, you can tell kind of what they eat? Um, I can say that. Yeah. Um, and there are exceptions I found after, yes, I have to be careful how I say it. Uh, the beak on this bird, it's like a cone or conical, and it's fairly heavy. Uh, sparrows have that or similar, not as strong. But birds with these type of beaks are considered seed eaters. And yet I found out that many of the foods that I've been told different bird species eat like hummingbirds, we know that they eat the sap, you know, the nectar. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't feed their babies nectar, I found out. They feed them insects and worms. The babies can't handle the, the sugar water. I mean, who knew? Who knew? <laughs> Lions and tigers and bears. <laughs> <laughs> and see, this, this is the house sparrow also. A, no, when, I would, when I was a kid in Connecticut, my mom called it the English sparrow. This also is an exotic invasive bird. And the lower picture there in the center, that's Central Park in New York. <laughs> but then you have the, the male and female house sparrow. That's the Winn-Dixie parking lot bird for Publix. <laughs> I have never seen a house sparrow out in the woods or the field. I've only seen them around people stuff. So, where did they live when, before people came along? I don't, I don't know. Ruby crowned kinglet. Wow. This is kind of like the blue gray gnat catcher. They're up there in the trees, but unless you're looking or whatever, you don't even know these little birds exist. And this is a rarity to actually see the little uh, ruby, the red colored feathers on the head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I got this picture at, right by the bathroom at um, Beersford Lake, uh, Beersford Park, by the parking lot bathroom there. And I couldn't believe it. It's just like eight or 10 feet from me. And that's, I got to photograph that guy. Because <laughs> normally it just, you know, just, you don't see it. <laughs> Is it just the shape of the bird that helps you identify it? Well. That's always a helpful if, you rec if the shape if speaks to you, so to speak. Uh -huh. Like if there's a mocking, northern mockingbird up on a power line and it's backlit so it's just this dark silhouette, I'm thinking it's the mockingbird just because the shape and, and that's what I expect to see in a certain neighborhood, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of my, what I call birding mentors, would, would say this to me at times, always presume that what you see, the bird, is the usual and not some rarity from the other side of the world you know, or the other part of the country. I mean, if, if it turns out otherwise, because we birders are always looking for that next rare bird or something. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to like make something different just in case. And here's, here's our resident wren, which is the Carolina wren. This is the little bird with the big voice. Proportionally, there's no other bird, and it's a beautiful voice that, that has such a loud call as this bird for its size. Have a bird house in my planter, right outside my bedroom. And my backyard shed and my previous house had them. Yep, I have a friend. They worked. They worked into their screen porch. Yes. 
They'll almost land on you too. They'll come right almost. Now, one of the things about wrens, or at least some of them, they make like a, a rattle sound, not like a, a singing call. Like, I can't quite do it, but a rattle sound. Mm -hmm. and, and right now we have, I don't have pictures of it here, but there's a, an, another very common bird from up north that we now have around called the house wren. And that has even more of that rattle sound. But, but, it's not, but once again, it's not like you're hearing a, a, a chirping call. Question on the nesting. Do they reuse nests? Because sometimes I'll see three or four nests and they're not used. Do they reuse them? I, I, I don't know for sure. Oh, but they, should we clean them out or just leave them? Oh, I'd say just leave it anyhow. Just in case. I, Cardinal's There's a... There are periodic nature walks that are sponsored by Volusia County. And some years back when I attended them, we were out doing some, it was a night walk. Either way, there was a spider web. And the leader of that walk cautioned us not to damage the spider web. And I forgot where the conversation started. They said that it takes a lot out of the spider, literally a lot of uh, energy, whatever, out of the spider to make the web. And if you damage their web, then they have to do that whole process, which uses up More. some of their substance or whatever. So as far as the nest goes, I'd say just leave it anyhow. You know, if, if it looks like it really is falling apart or something, then you, you don't want it there. Well, like the osprey nest, they'll use them forever, or the eagle's nest, you know. Okay. Our two most common owls, our most common is the barred owl. And for those who aren't familiar, those little streaks there are, are where the name barred comes from, like those are little bars. I was at Gemini Springs, where the biking trail parking lot is, and just down the trail a bit. Mm -hmm. And I walked over to the, 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 the treat area just off to the left. And it was like a, an a, a area like that that was just some grass, but trees the other way. And I was walking down one side of the, ed, the, the edge where the trees were. And this barred owl flies across from the other side. And 12, 13 feet from me, in the branch of the tree, just right there. I've seen him and that, that's the guy. <laughs> he posed for me. This is um, a, based on that's a young, one or two youngsters back there and a little dead rat or something. I can't see it from the picture much. This was in somebody's front yard across the street from East Lake Toho in Narcusi. This bird was nesting, you know, just 10, 12 feet off the ground in this big oak tree. And doesn't, well, it's, its horns are not up, but you can see it lying down here. There's a feather. Uh -huh. That is the great horn. I believe you. Just, and it just looks different. Too. One mention about their call, the barred owl does this sometimes very loud, and it's called, like, who cooks for you? Well, the great, the great horned owl has a call something like it, but uh, even though and it's a larger bird, but its call is a lot more subdued, like, ooh, 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 you know, that type of. On Howland Boulevard, about a quarter mile or third of a mile east of Elkham and Howland, mm -hmm. where there's a, up on a hill, there's a electric substation type thing. Mm -hmm. There's a tall pole that has a disc on top for ospreys to nest. They never do, but every year or so, this lady, great horned owl, is up there with her little ones. Every springtime, in the, or late winter, early spring, drive by and glance up once in a while, you will eventually see it. But she had two of them this year. And of course, they're awake during the day because of raising the kids, whereas otherwise, you know, night owls. <laughs> <laughs> and barred owls are, are generally not all that nocturnal. One of the things I learned about owls from one of the 
the live presentations we had at our West Volusia Audubon meeting once, they had an owl that couldn't be let back out into nature because it had been injured at one time. And whether it got injured this way or not, but the person giving the presentation shared many of the owls that get injured when they're flying across a road at night and hit a car because they, you know, they don't see the car coming and they're already there. I mean, however that is. Mm -hmm. Bald eagle, adult and juvenile. Gee, the juvenile does not have a white head and tail. <laughs> they say four to five years old before it finally has the white head and tail. Which brings me to the next topic. When I, this is the conversation about how can I tell all those birds? They all look alike. I want to make a claim that if you look up in the sky in our part of the world, there's really only three large dark birds. There's the turkey vulture, the black vulture, and the bald eagle. And if it's up to three or four years old, that bald eagle doesn't have a white head, so you don't see it as a bald eagle. But still, there's only three large, dark birds. So you know one or two, then the yes, you know, it's not that difficult. It's not like there's 20 or 30, like all those. How about a hawk? How about a hawk? <laughs> we, we only have one common hawk, which is the red shoulder, which we may get to. Yes? I have a field trip there coming up um, next week or so. All Except for three or four months in the summer. Okay. Our bald eagles, they are backwards. In, in most of the US, the bald eagles in the springtime, like anywhere else, they're nesting, OK? Our bald eagles nest in the winter. And in the summer, they fly north just like the northern birds fly south in the sun, I mean, in, in the winter. <laughs> they, 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 they nest the totally opposite smart. times of the year of the, the, of the northern bald eagles. I think you're probably going to have a really good time out there during that field trip. You'll like it. Yes. That's oh, yes. No. <laughs> Doesn't they're actually in the landfill? Or like, how, how do you know that they are on the there's, pile? There's two yeah. reasons I've been told that the, the eagles are by the way, there have been daily counts. Counts means sighting. You, you may count, see something twice, you don't know it's the same bird physically. Number one, they are a scavenger. And number two, if there's an injured gull, like a laughing gull or whatever, or other bird, they'll get that one. But yes, there's, there, the first time I, anybody know the name Michael Brothers? Michael, well, he, he's one of, he was the re recently retired director of the Marine Science Center. And previously, he was uh, the director of the Daytona Arts and Science Museum. And he's, he's incredibly knowledgeable about birds and also sea mammals. Okay. And um, he had told me one time that he, he, did a, he was doing a bird count at the landfill, 57 bald eagles. And I've heard even higher numbers. This is something that's sort of unique based on the roads. If you're on L LPGA, everybody knows what LPGA is mostly. Mm -hmm. It's a road that starts by the, the um, Intracoastal Waterway in Holly Hill area. And it comes around to Route 92 near the entrance to I-4. If you're on that road, the last half mile of it or so, late afternoon up to around sunset time, in the fall and winter, you'll almost always see one, th two, three, or four bald eagles flying like away from the landfill back to where they sleep at night. Because mm -hmm. in the world of many birds, especially the bigger ones, they don't sleep where they eat. <laughs> Ducks are like that, white ibis. I mean, there's a lot of birds, wherever they go during the day to eat, they're sleeping somewhere else, usually up in trees. Cause Larger, most larger birds eat on the ground. Yes? Is it true the females are bigger than the males? I've been told that many, many times. 
Okay. Matter of fact, I've been told it enough that if I see two bald eagles together, I'm going to presume the larger one's a female. Does the juvenile not look a little bit like a golden? Well, they do because they don't have the adult. Because they don't have the white heads, right. right. Yeah. Um, also, the golden has uh, different markings under, under the wings and under oh. the tail, which, is, which aren't necessarily hugely different. But I remember my first golden when I saw one out in north, northeastern Wyoming. It's like I, I didn't think maybe it's a juvenile ball. I just got it. The American Kestrel. This one posed for me um, just south of Lake Okeechobee. That's great. <laughs> and it, was, it was a great pose. And this could, have, this could be any, any power line or cable. Uh, the American Kestrel, they are also a winter visitor. The Hall, the, the road that goes from Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge to US-1 at Oak Hill, before you, if you're leaving the refuge and come driving towards Oak Hill, you come to the Hall Over Canal with that drawbridge. The last two miles or so along that road, up on the power lines, in the wintertime, you'll count anywhere up to two to three, four, five of these kestrels. It's like, when I don't see them anymore, you know, oh, must be spring. <laughs> they fly north. They so and pretty. here's something, too. They look pretty much the same. But the male, see this, this I don't know, gray, steel blue, whatever you want to call it, highlighting on the wing and head? And the female doesn't have that. That's the main, that's the way to, to tell male from female on this bird. How big are these? These are about they're that big. Too, too big. They're not big, but they're not small. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, well, I can't speak to that, which doesn't mean they don't. But they go down on the ground, and they, they can any any creature they can get, they're going to get. And I'm not sure how many, what the ratio of, of small birds to other things they can get to eat. But this is a merlin. See that now. For those of you who are new with this, the kestrel is a falcon. You know, you've seen, seen things with people with these big birds, they're called falconers. Well, the kestrel is that big, it's a falcon. And slightly larger and, and darker and a little bulkier looking is the merlin, also a winter visitor. And the merlins are not as common in the winter as the kestrel is, but we have them, they're out and around. And then there's the peregrine falcon, which is not that big a bird either, but it's still, you know, it's, it's a decent sized bird. This is, see how the wing is out like with a pointed end? That's your peregrine falcon. If you look up and see a bird that's not too big, but it's still not a little bitty bird, mm -hmm. and, it, and it has like pointed ends to the wing, you're looking at a peregrine. My wife and I were at an outdoor event in Orlando a couple of weeks ago. It's a diversity, it was something by the, um, uh, uh, it was downtown. <laughs> and as we were out in this. Oh, I know, yes, the, yes. Yeah, the name of it escapes me. Anyhow, we're, we're sitting down in some chairs and watching a performance on a stage, and I'm glancing up once in a while, and. So two different per peregrine falcons flying between the buildings, <laughs> wow. and I, based on the shape, I, you know, I didn't, I can't prove it, and I didn't have pictures, but yeah, based on the shape, that's for my background or knowledge, that's all it could have been. Hmm. And we're moving up from the falcons, these guys, the red shoulder hawks, they definitely are ground feeders. This was in my neighbor's yard, and it was standing on a small snake or something. The red-shouldered hawk is our most common hawk because, it, well, there's where the name comes from, the red-shouldered hawk. One of the things about this bird, and it doesn't show here, um, 
bird, at the end of their wings, there are long feathers called primaries. And where those feathers attach to the wing body, there's like a light colored, not quite white, but a light crescent type of a band at each, just before the primaries where this are attached. And when these guys are just gliding along and you see that, you know you have a red shoulder. You have to remember it, obviously, because none of the other hawks or birds up in the sky have that light colored crescent just before the primaries. Mm. Guess where I see this red shouldered hawk? <coughs> up, up over Dunkin' Donuts on the Daytona Road. For some reason, there's one that's quite often up in the tree. Oh, hey. that, that's fine. Maybe he likes it. <laughs> Um, oh, one other thing. The, when the red-shouldered hawk is flapping its wings flying, it got a certain speed to it. A red-tailed hawk, which is a larger bird, is a much slower beat. Not like slow, but much slower proportionately. Size. Seems to be. The turkey vulture and the black vulture, the turkey vulture is larger. And the turkey vulture has this beat, and the, and the black vulture has the faster beat, and it's smaller. Now, the turkey vulture, though, is, excuse me, the black vulture is larger than some really small birds. They go zip. So, but, but just, just as a something to remember, to try to tell the difference from one to the other, the larger bird in these, both these cases, the larger bird has a slower beat, you know, wing beat. Taller than me and he's walking. He goes, Why are you way back there? I said, Because my legs have to take two steps for every one of yours. <laughs> <laughs> okay, red, red tailed hawk. Don't worry about that. In the upper right, that, you know, this is a mockingbird, and I've also seen it with blue jays harassing this red tailed hawk <coughs> so it'll get out of its neighborhood. And they actually hit, the smaller birds hit these birds, and in flight, any one of these larger birds, um, eagle, the hawks, um, they're cruising around the sky, and some other bird, a smaller, comes over to harass it to get it out of its neighborhood. And I have never, ever seen the larger bird, which could tear the smaller one apart, ever turn around. Either it just went about its business or it flew away, but it never turned around to, to deal with the smaller bird that's pecking on them. That, that, that is cool. <laughs> I've, I've seen them do that to owls before, too. OK. They just kind of chase them off. <laughs> and the, the bigger bird just do, like, either. Time and time again. Flies away. <laughs> now, just, oops, just, just to mention it, uh, the red tail on the red tail hawk, it just, it has this little black line that goes over, you know, towards the end of it. A juvenile red-tailed hawk and the red-shouldered hawk, and I think most of the hawks and falcons, but most of the hawks, the juvenile has a very pale tail with like very thin, horizontal bars that go across. I don't have pictures of it here. These are all adults. But just to mention it, if you see a bird, gee, that looks like it should be a red-tailed hawk, but it doesn't have a red tail, this is a juvenile, okay. if, you're, if you believe it's the right size and all. And between the red tail and red-shouldered hawk, the other hawks we could have are very, very small populations, like Cooper's hawk, and sharp shin hawk, you know, just we don't see them that often, even though they're not a rarity here.